Uh, welcome to our discussion on the future of cancer treatment at the Global Virtual Cancer Conference 2020. We're so happy to have you here. Um, I am Daniel Platt. I am the Vice President of Research and Engagement here at GRIT Health. Uh, and I also, uh, as a way of background, I have an MD from the University of Rochester. And I've worked throughout the healthcare industry over the last 10 years um, to really impact the lives of people with cancer and to make those lives better. Um, one area where I've done a lot of work in both biotech and for uh, larger pharma is on immunotherapy, which is going to be a key topic of discussion today uh, that we're going to be exploring with our great set of panelists. Um, before I get started, I want to hit a couple key points and go over some housekeeping issues. You'll see at the bottom uh, that there's a chat window, and we've already seen some use of that. You can click on that chat, and you can send messages to either all the panelists, which are all the folks uh, here in the back end with me, um, or you can switch that to all panelists and attendees and send messages to, uh, to, to everyone so that everyone can see. I suggest that you, you switch that now so that um, the messages are going out to everyone. There's also a Q&A box. Um, if you'd like, you can type your questions in there as well. Um, we'll also be monitoring the chat. So if you just wanna type questions in there, that's fine as well. Um, and before we get started, I really wanna thank uh, all our sponsors and partners who have made this possible. Um, and, and just thank everyone for attending and hopefully this is really educational and we can hit some key points and, and help uh, answer some questions. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about the future of cancer treatment, but before we do that, I wanna set the stage for that by going over a little bit of the past and kind of where we have been, where we are now and where we hope we're gonna be so that we can really have a, a good conversation about this. So, I kind of think of the, the generation of medicines within cancer as, as occurring in three revolutions. And the first revolution is chemotherapy. And that's actually younger than people think. So chemotherapy is only about 50 years old. The first chemo drugs were discovered in the late 1950s. And then we really took a, a little while to understand how to use them. So in the mid sixties is when chemo really came online and started having a, a huge effect on people's ability to survive. But as a lot of you know, Chemotherapy is really, really nasty. It's, these are nasty drugs. And the reason for that, of course, is that chemo widely prevents cell division and doesn't allow cells to grow. A lot of the time, and, and hopefully beyond cancer effects, meaning the, the chemo is, is killing the cancer cells, those outweigh the potential costs, which are where you know, healthy cells that are dividing rapidly will die. And a lot of those cells are in your bone marrow a lot of them are in your gastrointestinal tract, um, they're your hair follicles. And so that's why chemo has all these side effects. So chemo is kind of like this atom bomb. It blows everything up, um, but it blows up both the cancer cells and the healthy cells. And so even at the, at the beginning of chemo, people were already looking for different ways to attack cancer. And so the next revolution was in really kind of the, the 90s, as well as the early 2000s with our revolution in understanding the genome. Um, so the Human Genome Project, if everyone remembers uh, back to the early 2000s was a really, really big way um, in order to help us understand cancer uh, and understand all the cancer genetics and how it differs from a normal cell. But it also allowed us to start to pick out those mutations that cancer has that normal cells don't. And so this was really a starting point for targeted therapies, which we'll be talking a lot about today. So how do targeted therapies work? So as I, as I just mentioned, and a lot of you probably already know, cancer is the accumulation of mutations in cells. And so any one cancer can have hundreds or sometimes even thousands of mutations that give them special abilities. Uh, so one uh, mutation might give cancer the ability to grow on top of cells so that one cell can go on top of another, can go on top of another. That's something that normal cells can't do. Another mutation might allow cancer to enter the bloodstream. So the cells can, can move off and survive in the bloodstream. Still another might allow those cells in the bloodstream to seed other organs and grow in, in, in places where they're not supposed to. And that's of course metastases, um, which are you know obviously a huge problem in cancer and something that we're actively attacking and kind of the, the biggest the biggest thing that we want to prevent. Um, so to kind of to get, come back to the analogy, so those targeted therapies are really smart bombs and they're going after one particular spot. Um, 
And so one area that we're gonna be talking a lot about uh, a, a lot about today is lung cancer. And I wanna quickly kind of talk about a few of the mutations there just to give you a sense for what targeted therapies are, are going for. So I'm sure you, everyone knows there's a kind of an alphabet soup of genes, so I won't get into that too much, but just to mention things like EGFR that people may have heard of, or BRAF, E-R-A-F, um, or ELK. These are all mutations that happen in lung cells uh, very commonly and that we can direct um, therapies toward. Another mutation that we'll be talking a lot about today is NTRK, N-T-R-K. Um, and we have some great panelists who have personal experience both being on um, NTRK related therapies as well as helping to develop them. So we're really excited to have them. Um, and then, so that's the second revolution, the targeted therapies. And now we're, we're still in that revolution. So each of these, of course, you know, when we when chemo started, it's continuing. And of course, a lot, we use a lot of chemotherapy still because they're so effective. And when targeted therapy starting, it's of course continuing on because those therapies are really, really effective. That third revolution though, is immunotherapy. And uh, people in the audience might be very familiar with this and there's been a lot of commercials now um, and these drugs are becoming mainstream. Uh, I wanna quickly help you understand uh, how the immune system works and why um, getting the immune system to attack cancer is such an interesting and, and good idea. So typically uh, in your, your body every day, you're accumulating mil millions and trillions of mutations um, it's just a, a natural thing that happens. It's kind of the, the spark for evolution and for um, you know, general changes in, in, our, in, in life. Life is about mutation. Um, a lot of those mutations don't cause any problems or um, they make the cell not able to grow as well. And so the cell just dies. Some of those mutations um, can have really positive benefits. You know, we can grow an eye or you know, um, develop new, new abilities where you know, the regrow limbs, things like that, that, are, that happen in organisms that may feel like lizards. Um, so these abilities though can also have a bad effect and that effect is cancer. Um, so sometimes when cancer gains uh, those abilities to grow out of control, you know, the first step is for the body to kill those cells so that they don't get kind of to big C cancer, that they still stay little C cancer and that, you know, there's just this, um, there's no a growth of the of the tumor. So the immune system is great at doing that because it's specific. It's uh, it's really potent and well coordinated, and it also has a memory. So once a once uh, a immune cell uh, recognizes a cancer cell and kills it, it can remember um, some of the the ways that it's killed that cell, and it can remember and potentially kill it in the future which is what's something we're gonna be talking about a lot because immunotherapies have a lot of potential for uh, things like cancer vaccines. And we'll talk a little bit about something called CAR-T or chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And uh, that's a new therapy that you maybe have heard about. Um, so how do immunotherapies work in general though? They, cancer likes to hide itself. Um, it hides from the immune system and that's one of the skills it develops. So if we can unmask cancer, and have it so that the immune system recognizes again, then we can have a huge impact and the immune system can go in and kill these cancer cells. So, you know, we're really excited about those possibilities. I think, um, you know, that it's, it's, we're hitting that revolution. We're, we're right at the beginning of it, but the possibilities are really, really great and hopefully endless and we'll start to see some, uh, some amazing things happen. So um, with that, that's a kind of a quick overview. So that's where we are. We're, we're kind of in the middle of the targeted therapy phase and at the beginning of the immunotherapy phase. And of course, chemo is still being used and is still really effective, but we want to be able to recognize both its advantages and its disadvantage uh, and understand how that, that improvement in therapy has occurred over time. So I hope that was helpful. Um, now I'd like to introduce our great panelists and have them tell you a little bit about their experience and their story of both um, being on these medications, of learning about them, of helping to make them. Um, so, so, so excited to have them here today. I'd first like to introduce um, Andrew Shore. And Andrew is the president and co-founder of Patient Power. And he has a, a really interesting uh, personal story about his experience with, uh, with these therapies and 
um, you know, I'll let him get into that. So thank you so much for, for being here, everyone. And I'll pass it over to Andrew. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. You know, a couple of years ago, I read the book Emperor of All Maladies. And I think you did a lot of that book in about five minutes. So, and it was a really thick book. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, hello, everyone. Andrew Shore here, joining you today from, uh, from kind of chilly Durango, Colorado. And we're doing a safe home swap with another family. Normally I'm in uh, Southern California, it's a lot warmer. Um, I've been living this whole story that Dan described for a long time. In um, 1996, I was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. I never heard of it, didn't have any idea what it was. And uh, people with that form of chronic leukemia, the most common adult leukemia, are often in a watch and wait or watch and worry stage for a number of years because the treatments <clears throat> could cause more problem than the indolent nature of the leukemia just slowly growing. But after four and a half years, it was time for me to have treatment and the basis of treatment was chemo. But I was in a phase two clinical trial that added one of these targeted therapies that were coming online, as Dan said, during the 90s and early 2000s. Mine was called rituximab that targeted a protein on the B cell that was defective, the, one of these cancerous cells, and it worked. So instead of having maybe uh, with chemo, maybe a four or five year remission, I had a 17 year remission. And I've met people who had the chemo and targeted therapy combination in the same trial I was in, and some have never had treatment again more than 20 years later. So it can work, but, it, but with the chemo, as Dan said, the uh, atom bomb analogy, it can mess with your DNA and even way down the road, set you up for a second cancer. And it did for me. So 11 years after having treatment, I developed a second blood cancer called myelofibrosis, which is scarring in the bone marrow. Now that brings up another medicine. So Dan mentioned the human genome project. So one of the genes that was noted for myelofibrosis, scarring in the bone marrow, was the JAK2V617F gene. And somebody developed a medicine that inhibits it. So I've been taking, there are now two, I've been taking those medicines for seven years. I'm going bike riding later today. I had an enlarged spleen that shrunk. There are other side effects that can go with myelofibrosis and I haven't haven't um, had any significant side effects. So I've benefited in those two ways. A couple of other points, and that is uh, related to immunotherapy that Dan was talking about. So some of us with blood cancers, multiple myeloma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and maybe some others have been either uh, participating with either approved or investigational approach. What Dan alluded to, CAR T-cell therapy, chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy, where they basically ex build up your T-cells, extract them, take them to a lab, give them hamburger helper, give them a virus or something that will recognize your cancer, inject them back and have that virus lead the T-cells, the beefed up T-cells to have your immune system do the job it didn't do the first time because the cancer cells were hiding, as Dan said. So that's very exciting. And then the other thing I'll just mention about my day job is I run Patient Power, which reaches about 300,000 people online a month. Dan mentioned about different genes, like for solid tumors as well. So we have a program coming up for the minority of lung cancer patients, where it's fueled by the RET gene, R-E-T gene. But as you'll hear about with Susan and Mark are gonna talk about NTRAC and how that gene can show up in different cancers. So what I see happening is, it's not so much about where your cancer is, but it's about what's fueling it. So if you think about it, if you have breast cancer, you go to the breast cancer clinic, but maybe you have a certain gene that's fueling it and you have something more in common with somebody 
who's going to a different clinic. So maybe there's going to be a genomically or genetically driven clinic where you guys, no matter where the cancer is located, are getting the same medicine. And it's not about where it's cited in your body, it's about what's driving it. So I'm very excited about the progress and uh, I'll be happy to take questions later and can't wait to hear from the other folks. Thank you so much, Andrew. And a great point you made at the end there that we're with targeted therapies, we're at the point where we can reach around and spread uh, treatments to different cancers. And we're not just treating you know, one disease with one drug, we're treating many potential diseases with one drug. So another really big benefit of targeted therapy, and thank you for mentioning that. So next I'll be introducing Upal Basu Roy. He's the executive director of research at the Longevity Foundation. Um, and again, uh, lung cancer, as I mentioned before, an area where a lot of targeted therapies have come on around, uh, come online and really changed the treatment of this cancer. So I'll let Upal introduce himself and give you a little bit of a, in, a, a quick overview of kind of what he's been doing and how he's helping. Hello, everyone. My name is Upal Basaroy, and I am the Executive Director of Research at the Jevry Foundation. And hello, hello, hello from New York City. And for those of you who are logging in from Europe or rest of the world, good evening, and thank you for joining us. So my, so by training, I, I, I trained as a cancer researcher. So I, I, ha I have a PhD in cancer research, and then I trained as a public health scientist. And I still remember in 2004, when I was a young graduate student, in 2004, the first mutation in a gene called EJFR was discovered in lung cancer. And I still remember the excitement that everyone was going through that, oh my God, this is fantastic. And the first drug called Eressa that was, that was sort of targeted towards this particular gene was also being developed at that time. And ever since then, uh, so I joined Longevity Foundation in 2015, and uh, when I became a patient advocate, there were only two drugs approved for, there were only two uh, mutations, EJFR and ALK, for which drugs were approved in lung, lung cancer. But now, flash forward to 2020, as Dan mentioned, we have seven FDA-approved uh, we have drugs for seven, uh, seven uh, targetable mutations in lung cancer, and the progress has been absolutely immense. And again, incredibly, incredibly honored to be here and uh, delighted to represent the lung cancer community. Thanks, Paul. Um, so happy to have you here as well. Uh, next, I want to introduce um, Susan. Susan is a patient and co-founder of N trackers, and that's that mutation that we've been talking a little bit about in lung cancer, as well as that we said can occur in other um, other cancers. And Susan will tell you a little bit about the work she's done, as well as her own uh, personal history with cancer. So thank you so much, yeah. Susan. Sure, thanks, Dan, and thanks for having me. Of course, an airplane's going ahead right now as I start to speak. <laughs> so if you hear some noise, hopefully we'll be gone soon. Um, so I'm a uh, thyroid cancer survivor. Um, I was diagnosed in 2004 um, and my cancer was progressing, progressing, progressing to the point where I was running out of options. Um, and it wasn't until I had genomic testing done back in early 2018 um, of my actual tumor sample um, from a recent surgery that um, uh, came out to be that I had N-TRAC gene fusion. So, um, Right away, um, I, I went on a uh, targeted therapy for NTRAC. And again, I was running out of options. So I, it was really, it was the last hope that I had um, to stop my tumors from growing. Um, and literally within, um, you know, within six months, my tumor shrank uh, 50%. Um, so a specific target. Now, I was never on chemotherapy, but I know um, from talking with others um, that chemotherapy can be very harsh. My side effects in relation to that are minimal. Um, so I'm very thankful that, these, that this drug is out here and can be so precise and, and targeted. Um, and the way you become, the way it's detected is only through genomic testing. So it's very important for cancer patients to get that done, especially when uh, your cancer is progressing. Um, and the other thing, somebody, uh, Dan mentioned earlier, so for NTRAC, it's found in any part of the body. Um, so there's 18 plus different cancers um, where NTRAC is found. So it really doesn't matter what type of cancer you have, it's just what's driving it. 
Um, so the other thing uh, Dan mentioned briefly is that I founded um, the ntrackers.org or a co-founder of that. So basically um, when I started uh, researching the NTRAC inhibitors, there was not a lot of information out there and there were so few of us on a clinical trial um, for this drug. So I started a Facebook group, um, found patients, um, which was very helpful for the mental aspect of this um, journey. And then also um, co-founded uh, co the ntrackers.org, which now we're an official organization um, and hopefully getting 501c status um, within the next year. Um, really to be a place where people can learn about NTRAC um, and, and support them through the journey and patients and caregivers. So I'm really excited about that. We're still new, we're still evolving, uh, but hopefully a lot of uh, good things to come in the years to come. So thank you. Thanks so much, Susan. And uh, I'm really excited to hear your story and so happy that uh, you, you were able to find that drug and looking forward to hearing more about some of the, the side effects and so kind of unmet needs um, that you, you uh, are recognizing. There was a question here about um, for you uh, about those side effects, and we'll get into that in, in just a little while. Um, I'd like to first introduce, though, um, Mark Fellis, Dr. Mark Fellis. Uh, he's the Global Medical Affairs Head um, of the TRK franchise, or the TRAC franchise, uh, at Bayer Pharmaceuticals. And thank you so much, Mark, for being here. And um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, how Susan, how you played a role in Susan's life and kind of helped to, to build those uh, those targeted therapies. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation, actually, and uh, good morning or good afternoon. Um, I'm located in uh, in Switzerland, in Geneva, so it's why it's uh, it's going to be darker and darker behind me. So um, I, I'm Mark Toulouse. Uh, as Dan said, I'm the Global Medical Affairs Head for the track franchise that includes two track inhibitors, uh, larotrectinib, the drug that Suzanne uh, uh, took, and uh, I think she's still taking it. And uh, uh, say another drug, say tractin, which is in development. Uh, and this one is will be for the patient who progress after a first generation track inhibitor. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. And uh, just to explain you about how we developed uh, this drug. Uh, and as uh, Andrew said, um, this drug is probably the, the first of its kinds because Actually, uh, it's not one tumor type and one uh, target. It's basically the target, the genomic alteration, which is called here the NTRAC gene fusion that, that is identified. And then if you have it, then the, the, the drug that I'm, I'm referring to uh, could be active actually. Without that, there is no way that this drug is, uh, will be effective. But the, the, I wouldn't say the main issue, but um, this rare alteration or mutation is uh, found is a high uh, high number of patients in very very rare tumors, especially in in the pediatric population, uh, like the infantile fibrosarcoma. But it's also extremely uh, um, uh, seen as a low frequency in the most common tumor types, like lung cancer, breast cancer, or colorectal cancer, which makes it difficult to find those patients who could benefit from the drug, and. Uh, when I say our tracking, there are uh, another. There is another one as well um, in the U.S. and also in Europe. But this is really what Andrew uh, nicely said. I mean, in the future, uh, most probably, it, it won't be uh, the the patients with this genomic alteration won't be treated based on the 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 organ where the tumor originates uh, from, but based on the genomic alteration. We are not yet there because everybody is still thinking tumor specific, but I think with more and, and more drug like this, uh, and it's coming, it's not uh, 20 years from now, it's coming, uh, uh, we'll be, uh, we'll be um, going into that direction. And Andrew was talking about the, the RET inhibitor. It's already uh, here in the US. Uh, and it's not only for lung, it's also for uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma. And BRAF, I mean, BRAF, it's not, uh, it's a known target. It's also present in a, in a thyroid carcinoma. So the more you draw, the more drugs uh, you will have with a genomic alteration or mutation in a specific tumor type, the more, um, the, the, the faster we'll be uh, going into that direction of treating uh, patients with specific genomic alteration and not based on their tumor type. 
they have. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I think you, again, make that really strong point that we're really moving towards an era of personalized medicine where, where a cancer patient's genome will be mapped and then we can pick and choose the drugs at the right time. And we're moving quickly towards that. Uh, we're not quite there yet, like you said, but we're, we're really far along the road. So it's really exciting times. Um, for the first question, I'd like to talk a little bit. We've, we've mentioned kind of the past and the present but I wanna get us looking a little bit toward, more towards the future. And of course, in the future, we need to address the unmet needs that exist now, the side effects, um, the people who are, who are failing therapy or therapies, th therapies fail them because um, you know, really we, we're, we wanna, we wanna uh, evince a cure. We want to, cancer to be a thing of the past. So um, in order to start to address that question, um, I wanna ask each of you, what are some unmet needs um, or questions that you think still exist, both within your experience as, as a patient um, and kind of your understanding of cancer, as well as your experience as a physician or a researcher. Um, so maybe we can start with you, Paul, uh, to talk a little bit about some of those unmet need or, or questions that still exist from the advocacy perspective. Thank you, Dan, for that question. And uh, I want to actually thank my fellow panelists for setting up the stage beautifully for, uh, for, for this part. And I think when I think of unmet needs from the lung cancer perspective, and I think this is sort of broadly oncology in general as well, I think three sort of things sort of really jump up to me. And I think the first thing is, you know, yes, we have made a lot of progress in targeted therapies, but Dan sort of alluded to this is, you know, cancer sort of become resistant. They sort of become, they sort of outsmart these targeted therapies and the cancer starts growing. So in the beginning, a patient may have a very good response to these targeted therapies, but then what happens is the cancer starts growing. And then the big question that comes up is what's next? And I think that's one of the biggest unmet needs in uh, the lung cancer community, figuring out what's next for those patients who benefited from targeted therapies, but then, you know, when their cancers become resistant. The second unmet need, and uh, Susan set up the stage very beautifully for this, is I think we need more comprehensive biomarker testing. I think, yes, lung cancer and a lot of oncology is very precision medicine driven. We have a much better understanding of the genes or the alterations that drive these tumors. But I think we need something called comprehensive biomarker testing where a piece of the patient's tumor is tested to see what mutations are present so we can really match patients to the right treatment at the right time. So I think, you know, all of this progress is great, but if you're not able to identify patients to match them to the treatment, then I think this progress is futile. And finally, I'll also sort of end with my third point here, which is I think we need also better clinical trials. I think, yes, you know, clinical trials are great. And we, in, in lung cancer, we think that clinical trials are not, you know, that Hail Mary option. We think of clinical trials as standard of care. And a lot of patients, as soon as they're diagnosed with lung cancer, they sometimes go on clinical trials with that first treatment option. So it's not that last resort anymore. But I think we need better clinical trials and in two ways. First of all, a lot of real life patients, a lot of lung cancer patients will have brain metastases, but very often clinical trials will exclude patients with brain metastases. So we need a better understanding of how these new drugs work in the population that it's meant to serve. And the other piece of clinical trial is I think we need to make clinical trials more accessible so people from all parts of the world can participate in them. Great, thank you so much, Paul. Um, I wanna open that question up to, uh, to everyone else. So um, Andrew, maybe you can speak next about unmet needs that you think still exist from both your patient perspective as well as um, from your perspective as an advocacy uh, partner sure. And, and- Sure, yeah, well, thanks. Rupal made some great points. Um, so here's the thing, patients today diagnosed with cancer need to either the patient themselves or their loved ones who are supporting them need to play an active role in their care and ask questions because the changes in treatment or the availability of trials, they don't happen everywhere. Most people in the US are treated in community oncology settings and you may see a more generalist. Think of that uh, with all these changes going on, I almost say, think of that poor 
oncologists or hematologist oncologists trying to keep up on what's become a hundred cancers when there used to be 20, right? Because there are all these different genomic subtypes and all these kind of things. And then thank God, many more medicines or combinations. So one of the unmet needs is that we haven't done a good enough job in helping the typical cancer consumer recognize that it really makes a difference for them, A, to get smart, and B, in asking questions, and maybe if they're in that community setting, um, see a specialist or build a bridge between your local doctor and maybe a researcher who, like Upal is saying, is doing research in maybe that genomic variant type of cancer that you have. An example, a friend of mine in lung cancer, and you probably know her, Upal, is a woman named Janet Freeman Daly, very well known in the lung cancer area. So she has the ROS1 gene, not very common. She found out that a specialist, uh, Ross Kamage, who's a famous lung cancer specialist here in Colorado, was doing research on it. She lived in Seattle. So she went the extra step to be in that trial. And it, Janet is doing well. So the point is, we as consumers have to take on that responsibility because it's our life. No disrespect to the doctor that you're looking at right there. It's very tough for them to keep up on everything. If stuff is changing, like what Mark is developing, we need to see, does it apply to us? And I would always say just one more thing, like Upal said, um, we need to always consider a clinical trial at every step in our journey as applying to us. Always ask about it. Too few patients are in clinical trials and that slows the progress. And for us, it could give us tomorrow's medicine today. One last thing, had I not been in the trial that added rituxan to chemo in 2000, I'd be dead, okay? And instead I got a 17 year remission. So please consider trials and go the extra mile. Thank you so much, Andrew, and you make an amazing point. And the more people we get into trials, the more we'll learn, the more we can advance treatment. So it's it's probably, probably the most important thing in order to generate new therapies. Um, I wanna pass it over to Susan to tell you, I know there were some questions about her side effects while being on NTRAC therapy. I wanted to give her a chance to talk about that and talk about some of the unmet needs that she might personally be having or as well as see um, people in the NTRAC community. So Susan. Yes, um, so I just want to um, build on what um, Upal said and also Andrew. So part of my story is, um, so I knew about genomic testing. I heard about it because I was in thyroid groups. I knew somehow it would change my course of treatment, but I didn't really understand it. And it was actually a second opinion appointment that I went on um, to a major, I'm lucky, I'm in an area where I can go to about five major institutions within a two hour drive, get in a car and go. Um, I went on a second opinion because, again, I was running out of options. So I went on a second opinion to talk about a completely different trial to give me more radiation. And I didn't really want to even go on this appointment because I didn't want more radiation. I already had a huge amount of, uh, in my body, it was just, you know, I, I was not looking forward to it. So I walk into this um, oncology office and the doctor said, you know, your cancer isn't acting the way it should. Let's do genomic testing. And right away, I was yes, just do it. And I knew this institution had a great genomic testing um, program. So immediately I'm like, sign me up and just do it. And it really was a, a life, um, you know, a, a game changer. It's completely changed the course of my cancer treatment. Um, so the thing, what, what I think is needed, and Andrew um, commented on this, is the community hospitals versus the main institutions, in that we have to have affordable, accessible genomic testing it doesn't matter if you live in the middle of Oklahoma or if you're in Pennsylvania or Texas, right? It should be available to everybody who has cancer because there are more people out there that probably have these rare alterations and, and drugs can help us. Um, so it, it just needs, it needs to happen and hopefully insurance companies in the United States um, get on board. Um, and hopefully that's coming with different types of testing to more affordable things. So um, again, everyone should have access to it. I mean, I'm, 
it shouldn't just be me that's living because I live in a good place. It should be anybody in the country. Um, the other unmet need, um, I think, is the mental aspect. Um, you know, we, we all take these drugs and everything, but that's the reason I started the Facebook group, is because it was such a rare mutation and such limited people were on it. And I was going to be the second person in my hospital be, to be taking um, this NTRAC inhibitor. So I found it very stressful um, from a mental aspect. And I found other people through social media. And the, the main response immediately from these people was, I'm so glad you found me. I was so alone and I didn't know anybody else on it. So connecting patients is very, very important, um, especially when you do have a rare mutation. Because, you know, I, I belonged to thyroid groups before, but not, but there was nobody else in there who had my, my this NTRAC gene infusion. So you, you, you find yourself in a different space uh, mentally. Um, and then uh, somebody mentioned side effects. Um, so again, I was not on chemotherapy um, for thyroid cancer. It's a completely different course. Um, they give you radioactive iodine, which basically attacks your thyroid gland and kill off any tumor cells that are left over. Um, so that has its own side effects because you go into a hypothyroid state. So basically it's like taking out your thyroid and not giving you any drugs to stay normal. Um, but so, it, so that was my, you know, and in, the, in the scheme of things compared to chemo, I was very, very fortunate to only have to go through a hypothyroid state for a certain amount of time. Um, but with this drug, um, I mean, I took it, um, my tumor started shrinking, you know, within six months, I had a 50% reduction and I've been stable ever since. But my side effects are very limited. Um, and I consider myself very fortunate um, to be on this drug. Um, I have more withdrawal side effects. Um, so I take the pill twice a day, 12 hours apart. And before I approach my next dosage, um, I get muscle pain, stiffness. Um, I can get a facial uh, nerve feeling in my face. Um, I get this. Um, you know, this burning sensation kind of inside, like somebody has a candle on the inside of me going out. Um, but the, the, if I had to rate them in order, um, the muscle um, stiffness and um, um, pain is probably, is, is, is the worst. Um, I, I can, I, the way, I, the only way I can explain it um, is I consider myself a mummy <laughs> wrapped up and I can't really move. Um, and again, as soon as I take my, I usually end up taking my pills a little bit early, um, just because that side effect can get pretty severe. And as, and as long as I take the pill within an, a half hour to 45 minutes, it goes away. Maybe I could give you an explanation about your pain actually, because um, the track is a, it's a receptor that is found in, in some cells and normally it regulates pain. So, a track inhibitor such as larotractin, the pills that you take, is acting on that and uh, and basically um, uh, uh, dimin di diminish the pain. But the the the, the lens on the duration of the effect of one pill is usually 24 hours, but in some patients it's a bit less. Uh, 24 hours, 12 hours, sorry. But uh, in some patients it's a bit less, and it could be uh, 11 hours. And it's maybe why you have this happening, uh, especially close to taking the next pill or if you have a break. And uh, usually this occurs or stays a few days and it's really not uh, convenient. It's, it's really a, a pain that is coming back and it's, uh, it's really not good. But as you explained, if you take it, uh, take the, the drug, uh, the, the pain will go away um, quite quickly, but um, it depends on, on each patient actually. But, uh, but uh, we don't have yet um, a guidance for managing that. Uh, and I'm talking about all track inhibitors, not only our drug, but uh, we are working with some, uh, with some experts in the field to provide a guidance on that. And Mark, you're, you're really bringing up an important point, which are something called off-target effects. And so because the targeted therapies are great, but those receptors that targeted therapies are going after, those genes, also happen in other cells and healthy cells. And so a lot of the side effects from targeted therapies are because of these um, effects on cells that don't, you don't want to hurt or you. And so some of the effects yeah. that Mark's talking about with Susan are, are related to those. Um, and it, 
to that point, I want to quickly um, talk about and answer. I know there's a lot of questions, and I want I want to make sure everyone understands that we're going to be able to get to get to questions, um, and uh, in, in the future in a little bit here. But um, I want to mention about particularly about CAR T, and there was a question about CAR T in solid tumors, and I want to bring that up because I think it has a nice um, way of, uh, of talking about it in the context of these off-target effects that I was just mentioning. So CAR-T or chimeric antigen receptor T cells um, are uh, cells that you, you take them out of the body, you genetically manipulate them, and then you put them back in so that they can go after cancer. And they've had the most impact in the blood cancers, hematologic malignancies, because those cells uh, tend to have some very, very common projections on them, some proteins to target that by killing all of those cells, you can uh, enable both decrease the cancer without uh, really potent off-target effects. So without those huge amount of side effects, part of the reason that CAR-Ts have been hard to use in solid cancers is because similar to what Susan experienced you know, with, with the side effects, when you give someone a CAR-T, you're gonna have those, those cells attack not just the cancer cells, but also other cells in the body. And so it's been very hard to find ways to, um, to get around that and to provide a treatment that works without really potentially terrible side effects and this autoimmune, autoimmune attack where these new uh, immune cells are going after the body's own cells. Um, so we are making some progress. There was uh, recent research um, targeting a specific receptor called uh, MC, MUC1 and that's really exciting because that's kind of the first solid tumor uh, that we can target with CAR-T. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, hopefully about that in, in the near future here. I wanna bring it back to Mark because I don't think, uh, Mark, you got a chance to talk about some of the unmet needs that you're seeing and um, how you think uh, we can address some of those issues in the near future. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And actually, uh, Upa already addressed it. I, I think there are several things. The, the first one is that uh, even if you 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 find um, a mutation or genomic alteration, it doesn't mean always that uh, that you're gonna that it's going to be effective. You could have some primary resistance. You could have also secondary resistance. After you respond to this drug, you could have additional mutations that leads to progression. And this is also something to address. I mean, what what could we do for the patients to uh, to address that? And I think it's it's still. Um, within the same uh, uh, idea. I mean, how to be sure that the genomic alteration are the ones that drives the, that drives the tumor growth. And I would say the, the, the genomic, uh, comprehensive genomic profiling is something that should be done for all patients um, because it's only like this that you will be able to identify those mutations that, that are targetable with some drugs. Um, and this shouldn't be done most probably uh, at the beginning, but at different time points because you could have additional mutation over time. Um, but as Suzanne said, it's uh, it depends on how it's covered by health insurance. And um, this is not cheap for now. So I would say the development of those technologies will probably drive the, drive the cost lower, but also it will improve the technology itself. It could be done on tissue samples, but also in the future, and it's already being done in, uh, in the blood. So this is, probably where and there, there is the, the biggest unmet need. I mean, it's when patients progress uh, on, on any drugs and uh, what could be done for them. And combination is something to explore, but in rare rare diseases such as NTRAC, it's really difficult to have, a, as I said, a proper uh, uh, clinical trial actually, because there will be so few patients with the same uh, alteration, not only NTRAC, but something else. And it could be, Expand it to other um, other uh, alteration actually or mutations, but uh, this is where uh, yeah industry and also patients and physicians of course has to work on because it's it's where I mean it's together that we're going to find a, a solution. Yes, thanks, Mark. Um, all great points and really appreciate it. Um, before we go on to another question, um, I want to uh, quickly address. Michelle and Jacqueline's question um, in the context of what, what I wanna um, ask you guys about. So they were asking about gynecologic cancers and whether there's new treatments available. And, you know, I think one of 
the the issues that I you know that I commonly see um, in working within the cancer community is that there's such a deluge of information from all over the place. There's so much constantly done in research that it can be hard to follow the new changes that are happening or, or the new um, improvements that we're seeing in medications. So I want to ask the panel, um, you know, what do you think the best way for people to stay up to date on all this new information is? What are what do you recommend? Um, to people and uh, how do you stay up to date personally with all these new happenings in, in cancer therapy? Um, so we could start with Andrew. Thanks. Right, so, um, so when I was diagnosed with leukemia, I was clueless. My wife and I were in tears. We didn't know anything. We hadn't heard of it. And that's happening all the time. I mean, think of one of the um, acute cancers like inflammatory breast cancer or AML or ALL. And somebody's maybe hospitalized immediately. Oh my God, their world is changing. So how do you get perspective? So in this uh, digital world, there's something really cool. People like Mark or Upal are scientists and they've devoted 20, 30, 40 years of their life reading all these research papers, participating in research, Dan, you too. So I kind of see you guys as our search engine, right? Because if I put together as a medical journalist, like we do on Patient Power, or like um, Longevity does, or a number of the advocacy groups, and we have three of you there, and we say, rather than us look for articles and try to make sense of medical stuff, what do you guys think? And often guided by us as journalists or uh, leaders in the advocacy community who are in the know we can immediately get perspective maybe in the space of an hour or recurrent programs or comprehensive articles. So I would urge patients to find a, a maybe a triangulate some groups that are leaders in the field, patient advocacy groups, um, a media site like Patient Power, another uh, a group that you trust, triangulate though maybe between a couple, and where we often feature experienced patients like Susan, experts like Mark and Upal, Dan. So when we ask them, you guys have been doing this for years, what do you think is significant? Rely on that rather than little snips of things or what one person said on Facebook, no disrespect to your group, Susan, I'm sure you curate it really well, but there are others that aren't, that can be crazy making. So. Um, really find the sources you trust. Yes, thanks, Andrew. Um, anyone else want to comment on sources that you use or where you recommend people go? Mark? Maybe, uh, I mean, that that's really great, uh, Andrew. I mean, you, you almost said everything again, but uh, I think it's also a discussion with your treating physician because sometimes, maybe not all the time, they do refer you to great patient advocacy group, great websites, done independently or by uh, companies. Sometimes those websites are also great and uh, they are full of data reference and you can basically check all the data. Um, but I think the patient advocacy group, the ones that you trust are really, really important because it's where you're gonna find the information and, and connect with people, connect with Suzanne through the, the face, Facebook page. But this is one example. There, there, are, there are many, many others. and. I think the 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 best uh, is to to be active, to be smart, as you said, Andrew, and to find information because at the end, it's you. I mean, you are driving your your future. Thanks, Mark. Um, Upal, I see you're off mute. Did you want to tag on to that? I just add actually one fifth source of very credible information, and that and that's the patient group themselves, like the end trackers or as Andrew mentioned, the Ross wonders. I think, you know, uh, you, let, let's not forget that, you know, we, we've made a lot of progress and patients are living longer because of these new therapies and patients themselves have organized into groups as Susan mentioned. And a lot of these patient groups themselves, like the Ross wonders, the ARC positives, the end trackers, they also provide very specific focused information on these very specific types of cancers. 
and they also have lists of experts sometimes available on their on their sites which you know people can uh, refer to so i would add that to the list of sources as well great point paul thank you um, and, and Michelle and, and Jacqueline, to get a, a better answer to your question, you guys, um, as you know, people with gynecologic malignancies, you know, we're in a in the stage of starting um, immunotherapies in those areas, and so there's some really exciting work. Um, and pembrolizumab, for instance, I think I believe was just uh, approved, and then there's some PARP inhibitors, which are another drug class that are new. So all exciting stuff and, and targeted therapies and immunotherapies are coming together to really have an impact on uh, diseases like yours. So um, really exciting to see. Dan, could I just add one thing quickly? Of course. So let, we, we kind of talked about the difficulty at the community hospital level with your doctor keeping up. So you say, okay, well, if I go to a patient advocacy group, will it give me a clue as to who might be a knowledgeable specialist that I could consult with? And the answer is yes. So longevity or any of these other groups have medical advisory boards. And what you can do is you, these are the super specialists in the field. So it could be one of them or from their institution, it might not be the super doctor, it might be their right-hand person. But the point is that'll give you a clue and you can ask these advocacy groups in where I live in Oklahoma or Pennsylvania or Seattle, is there somebody who's knowledgeable about this situation that the tests have shown I'm in? And then uh, that's a good way to then be able to take action. Thanks so much, Andrew. So uh, I see that we have uh, less than 10 minutes left. Um, in that time, I'd like to uh, pose a question and also if we can take some questions from the audience if they're still coming in. Um, the question I, I wanna to pose to the, to the whole panel is, are there any new pieces of cancer research or new things that you have seen, articles, um, you know, uh, anything that you think is going to have an impact in the future? Um, and what do you think that impact might be? So uh, I'll open it up. Um, Upal, uh, maybe you can, oh, Aunt Mark, please. Yeah, I mean, Upal, Upal, you can, you could go first. I mean, that that's that's fine. Mark, you are you. Muted. Mark, okay, so you. I will start then. Okay. So I, I think recently there was a, a Nobel Prize that was given to two um, two researchers. I mean, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and also Jennifer Doudna. and this this was given um, based on the development of a new method uh, for genome editing called CRISPR, and this is. Um, Kind of op opening uh, doors uh, to uh, to even more personalize the treatment of patients, looking at the specific genomic genomic alteration and maybe correct it. And this is not for tomorrow, but this will come for sure. It, the the methodology has to be improved and um, and uh, successfully tested, but this will come and this will help specifically each single patient, not only in oncology. I mean, it will be broader than that, but this is coming. This is coming and it, it will be uh, the next uh, revolution. Thanks, Mark. Uh, any comments from other panelists? Things you'd like to see or the things that are coming, Upal? I think uh, Mark summarized beautifully. And the only thing that I'll add is I think one of the things that we've seen over the past decade in oncology research in general is in the, you know, I would say 20 to 30 years ago, we were spending a lot of time understanding the biology of the disease. But now, finally, I think in this decade, we are seeing some of that biology translate into action. And as Mark mentioned, I think the CRISPR-Cas example is a beautiful example that that's going to span a lot of disease spaces. And I'm, I'm sort of going to wear the lung cancer hat for a second and say that 10 years ago, or even 15 years ago, we didn't, we used to think of a lot of these mutations as undruggable. And one of those mutations is the KRAS gene. Now, this is probably the most common mutation in lung cancer, but for the longest time, we couldn't find a drug for it. But finally, we are seeing strides in making drugs for this very, very recalcitrant mutation. And that's, that's I think, a perfect example of where finally all of this understanding of biology is translating into action in a meaningful way for our patient communities. Great point, Paul. And uh, Andrew, yeah, please. 
I'm just going to talk about something a little more short term. You know, what's if you go back to chemo, what doctors learned is if they combine chemo drug A with B and C and then figure out that they do it together or sequentially, that would give a bigger cancer cell kill. We'll put chemo aside now. What's happening certainly in the blood cancers now is if we combine novel agent A with novel agent B or A, B, and C, like multiple myeloma is a big example, um, can we do better in the short term? So that's what's happening. The other things I think are further out and will be super exciting. But in the meantime, and I would urge people again about clinical trials, is there a trial with combination therapy where it hits the cancer cell in the jaw and in the solar plexus and chops it off at the knees and does better than a single agent? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, another really, really great point. Um, I, we have a couple of questions coming in and I'd like to uh, take a little time to address them. So um, Melanie asks, what are your suggestions for people living in rural communities that are typically unaware of genetic testing and or treatment? And similarly, Jen poses a question about getting into clinical trials. So maybe we can um, adjust, uh, address both questions. So rural communities and best way to find a clinical trial. Um, you know, how, how do we make sure that these benefits are happening for all people across cancer? Um, anyone want to offer a solution or suggestion? It, it's not an easy question, uh, actually, but um, usually the clinical trials that are available in the, in the country are public. Actually, there is a website called clinicaltrial.gov, and it's not always the case that the list of sites are uh, are, are listed, but most of the time they are, and you could find that. But again, it's not a easy way to uh, find the, the clinical trial where you could fit in. The best way is really to discuss with some uh, some uh, physicians if there is a clinical trial, because they will do the kind of pre-screen of, of clinical trials. But there is another way, and this is more um, collaborating with patient advocacy group, because I really believe that it's where you could target the, the, the information uh, um, for the patients because it's really a huge uh, load to look at each single clinical trial if it fits to you. If it's already pre-screened by patient advocacy group and put on their website, this will be much easier. And we are trying to, to help in, you know, for the Bayer clinical trials, but I think it should be done with all pharma company because it's, it's only like this that you will be able to, to have patients aware of any clinical trials or, as Andrew said, maybe an expert who could uh, provide a, a second advice uh, or second opinion. So I think, again, I mean, it's, it's really a collaboration uh, between everyone to, yeah, to increase the, the knowledge and, uh, yeah, and uh, facilitate the process um, for everyone. Thanks, Mark. And yeah, to, to tag on to that and add, uh, to approach two questions. So um, there's some questions about genomic testing, especially in uh, rural areas and rural communities um, and how best to approach that or what um, people can do to make sure that they're getting the same treatment you might get in a, in a city. Um, so I think one of the major things is technology and technology is driving the price of genomic testing cheaper. Um, and as it gets cheaper, community hospitals can afford it and they can uh, be able to, to run those tests. Um, so technology is a big point. Computer science, um, you know, is a big thing that, that brings that in. Application of computer science to the genome makes reading it much faster, and we can get those answers even quicker. So there is kind of this, this overlap between um, your questions, and they're both really great questions. And hopefully technology can continue to drive those prices down so that we can make these uh, available to everyone. Um, and as new treatments come on, like uh, you know, CAR T that Andrew was mentioning, and neoantigen vaccines, which are a really interesting approach. Um, you know, those prices may start high, but we can drive them lower through uh, better technology and be able to produce them faster. So there is this aspect of uh, the, the power of what we've produced before and the power of applying other areas of knowledge to cancer treatment. So I, I realize that we're, we're out of time now. Uh, I just wanna thank all our panelists so much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Upal. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Mark, for being here, for sharing your great insight. Uh, we really appreciate it. 
and I will pass it now back to Ben. Thanks everyone.